Hello everyone and welcome back. Today we're going to be taking a look at honeypots and what they are. This is really important if you want to do security researching in any way. So the honeypot is basically like a computer system with applications and data and services and the whole goal of this computer system is to fool cyber criminals into thinking it's a legitimate target. Now this can be used in a lot of cases and there's a lot of types of honeypots but we're not going to get into that. What we're going to do is we're going to just follow the try hack me's tutorial because this is an easy tutorial and it shows well what honeypots are and how to use them so we're just going to use a honeypot. In this specific example, we're going to use the Kauri honeypot. And we're going to look at it from a perspective of a security researcher. And we'll also see some data collected, we'll see some methodologies and stuff like that. So anyways, the whole point is to attract hackers and to see what happens. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to start machine. Obviously, this will allow us to connect to the honeypot. The first thing that we'll do is we'll actually connect to the honeypot and make some traffic. We will act as an attacker. And then after that, we're going to take a look at what we actually have on the real port. It's going to be, I think, SSH. And we're going to take a look at what changed, you know, during the whole interaction and what has attacker done. So as soon as we deploy, we can actually take a look at the next challenge while it is waiting. So as you can see right here, we have some classifications. So the basic definition of this is the low interaction honeypots offer little interactivity and basically they're capable of simulating only some stuff. So like, uh, you know, a service or stuff like that and capture attacks against it. Now, even though these have their uses, we have the medium interaction ones, which offer the emulating both of the service of the vulnerable service in this case, obviously, and the underlying OS. So they can simulate the OS as well. So then we have the high interaction honeypots, which are fully complete systems that are actually virtual machines themselves that include deliberate vulnerability. Now, of course, we can detect that this is a virtual machine, but we're going to get to that later. There's going to be a mention of that. And there's ways to avoid that as well. So then we have the deployment location. It can be internal, so inside of your LAN, or it can be external. Obviously, the external seems to be the most often one. So the first thing that you'll see in the challenge is actually to connect to the Kauri SSH honeypot. This demo is running a simulated shell. So what we're going to do is we're going to connect to this shell and we're going to try to, you know, run some commands or stuff like that. So the emulator shell will look pretty convincing and that's what we're expecting. So let's get into it. So let's open a terminal right here. So the first thing we'll do is, as you can see, we have the IP right here. So I'm going to go ahead and copy that. So sudo ssh root at and some IP. Now uh, the password, the SSH right here is going to be any. So this means you can type anything you want. So I'm going to type in Hawks framework right here for this so we can see some results later. Um, you don't have to do this. You can type any password that you want. And if we press enter, it should log us in regardless. Okay, now as you can see, it looks like a legitimate shell. And if I take a look at ID or something like that, we can see that we're root. And if I take a look at the uname, you can see that it seems that it's some kind of a Linux Debian or something like that. I wouldn't even guess that this is a honeypot, so everything should look the same. So it just told us to try to run some commands, you know, see what's going to happen if we do. So I don't know, we can run whatever you want. We can run who am I? We can go to cd var www. Let's see if we have something there. We don't. We can go to temp and see if we have something there. Nothing is here. So we can go back to root directory and we can see what we have right here. We have SSH, but this doesn't really matter to us because we're not going to use anything from here. But what's important for us is that if we can create a file, log back in and see if the file is still there. So this is going to be one of the things that you might notice. Now, of course, this is uh, pretty obvious in one way. So if this is the way they can spot the honeypot, then this would be too easy, right? But this is a bit indicator for uh, this current type of a honeypot, Kauri honeypot. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that every version of Kauri honeypot is going to have the same thing or that it's going to be even a thing when it's on a live example, but this could be an indicator. So, and it told us to create a file and I'm going to say touch sub to hawks. And if I take a look, the file is there. And if I actually quit and I reconnect, we can even use the same password. It doesn't really matter. So you're going to see that the file is not going to be there. So if I LSAL, you can see that the file is not here. So this is one of the indicators that can tell us what's going on. But if we take a look a little further, things, the honeypot won't be much used without the ability to collect data from the attackers that it's subjected to. Fortunately, Kauri uses an extensive logging system that tracks every connection and command handled by the system. So this is what I talked about. This is why we ran some commands. You can access the real SSH port using these options. Now we're going to dig into how to detect if it's a real honeypot in a minute. But first, we're going to take a look at what happened using this IP and this port. So it's the same IP. We're going to open a new tab and we're going to do sudo SSH. I don't know, demo at same IP. And we're going to say, oh, we actually need a custom port. So we're going to say, what was it, port 1400. And it's going to say, yeah. And we're going to say demo. So now, as you can see, we've logged into a different user at a different port for SSH for the same machine. Now, what does this mean? In this case, we're just using the same machine, so we don't have to boot up two of them.
So this time, this is not a honeypot. You also need to specify a port. This is just instructions for connecting to the machine, but we already know this. Usually there's a lot of data uh, connected to the honeypots. So one of the things is you can use logging platforms like LStack. You can use this to search through these logs and monitor everything and get some alerts and stuff like that. So now we have been instructed to take a look at the logs. The logs can be found in this specific directory. So we're gonna copy this and we're gonna just say CD and CD into that. So let's take a look at what we have in this directory. As you can see, we have the audit.log. If I cat into audit, Log. We're going to see some connection information and stuff like that. But this is actually the recovery log. As you can see, we have CMDs right here. So these are all the commands that are ran. Uh, in our case, we have the login attempt. This is why I use the custom password, Fox framework, because now you can see that this is the login and this is the password. Very simple. And it is a login attempt on the honeypot, right? On the SSH specifically, because that is the honeypot's setup service. Now we're going to take a look at the commands that I've used. I've entered some folders and I even made a file. So we have a closed connection here that's what happens and then we made the sub to hawks file and we ls just to make sure that it's there we quit and we reconnect it back and when we took a look it wasn't there and this is basically what happened now if i take a look at the cowry.json we can see a lot more information right here, but there's really no reason for us to read through this right now because we read the first file and we got everything that we wanted. But as you can see, we have the format, the key value pair, the classic JSON or stuff like that for our connections and for our events and stuff like that. So as you can see, we have the CMDs and right here, we actually have the username and the password. And the last JSON file doesn't actually have anything inside of it, but it doesn't matter because we got everything from the audit.log. So now after we looked through the log files, we can actually take a look what's next. Now we have attacks against SSH. So we have SSH and brute force attacks. Cowry will only expose SSH. This means adversaries will only be able to compromise the honeypot by attacking SSH services. Now we can defend against these attacks by using the public key authentication or just by using really strong passwords. But these attacks can't be ignored. It's really important that we write them down, look through them and stuff like that. So as you can see on this machine, we actually have a collection of 200 most common credentials used against Kauri. So we're going to take a look at that in order to answer some questions. So how many passwords include the words password or the variation of that word? So let's take a look. So in order to find this, we have to navigate back to home of the same user that we're using and we'll find this file right here, top 200 creds. And we can cat into it, but as you can see, it's a lot of stuff. Now we can't just grab password because that will not work. It will just show us like seven examples or something like that. Instead of that, we need to take into consideration the passwords that have like other symbols and stuff like that. So my idea was to run grep and p, just the letter p, and then pipe it another time and just run grep w. So now this is a little bit of a shot in the dark, but as you can see, we actually got all of the results that we needed. Like most of these are actually valid, but as you can see, we have the QWERTY, which is not a valid result. So we're going to have to keep that in mind. But if I do C as in count, it's going to count 16 of them. Now, as you can see, we have QWERTY right here, which is the invalid one, but the other ones are fine. So that means we have 15 of them and that seems to be accurate. So the next question asks us about the most common tool for brute forcing SSH. Now, as you can pretty much guess, it's Hydra. It's not going to be John or Hashcat because Hydra is the one that's used for brute forcing services like SSH and FTP and stuff like that over the networks. Is it the best choice or is there other tools? It doesn't really matter. In this case, the question is what is the most common tool? What IPS framework is commonly used to mitigate SSH brute force attacks? So if I Google it, and as you can see, the immediate result from Google will be fail to ban. So this is our answer. So most of the attacks on some of the services on the internet are actually automated because, because a hacker wants to compromise as much computers as he can. So there are some patterns that we can take a look at in order to notice if we have a bot that we're dealing with. So right here, the author of the Try Hack Me Room describes some of the commands that are usually ran uh, in order to, you know, uh, get some information about the system, specifically to get to know if it's a honeypot. We don't have to read all of this because we're actually going to have to use them in these examples. So I'm going to actually show you what CPU does the honeypot use. So as you can see from these comments, right here it seems that we have the cpu info uh, in proc so we can actually try to run this we're gonna have to go back not to this one but to the honeypot itself so as you can see the connection closed but that's fine we're gonna log back into honeypot and we can use any password so i'm gonna say any it doesn't really matter and uh, this is the honeypot we're root here so the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna run this command and it's going to say, what CPU does it use? And if I take a look at the CPU, it says that it's an Intel Core i9. And if I write this down, it seems to be the correct answer. So does the honeypot return the correct values when uname A is ran? If I run uname A, we're going to get results. And this looks somewhat legit. But if we compare the uname A with the cat etc issue, we're going to see that there's differences. And as you can see, we have the Acme web and we have Debian. And right here it says Ubuntu 18.04 LTS 
and then it stops. Now, this is a little bit unusual. It doesn't really match perfectly. So if I take a look at this, it asks us if uname is returning legitimate values, and we're going to say no. The reason for this is if I take a look at the hint, it's going to say, does the ETC issue match uname A? Because if we run the same thing on this machine, this doesn't really look exactly how we want it to. So we're going to answer no, and that seems to be the correct answer. So what flag must be set to pipe double get output into bash? So usually the flag for that can be found in like a help file or a man file, but you can actually guess because it's usually O as in output. And if we try to lowercase O, it won't work. But if we try to capital O, it will work. So we can actually Google this. So we can just type W get output into bash. And as you can see, we have the Q and the O right here. In our case, it's just O that's necessary. Okay, so now how would you disable the bash history using unset? So for this, we actually use the unset hist file. So what we have is the environment variables on a machine. So let's say, so if I type in env, uh, this is going to show me the environment. So uh, the stuff that we have right here are just environment variables. These variables are used for different purposes. One of the purposes in our case is the hist file specifies where the history file is. So we don't really need to have a history file. If we delete it, we want to unset it so it doesn't recreate and we can use unset set hist file. Now this won't do anything because we don't really have a hist file. So now let's go back to the main machine and just talk a little bit about bot identification. So this intro basically talks about, you know, how, how bots deal with malware and similar stuff like that. But we don't really need to read all of this right now. If you want to, feel free to. You can easily visit this challenge and try hack me. But I'm just going to jump into the questions because in the questions, we're actually going to do a practical show of it. So what brand of device is the bot in the first example searching for? In this case, a bot is searching for a specific device so they can exploit it. And we have bot command sample one.txt. So all we have to do is navigate bot commands. This is a folder and we have sample one.txt so cat sample one and as you can see we have a lot of text right here the first thing i tried is like um since it says sms or stuff like that i tried phone i tried router and it doesn't really work so what they meant is what type of device is that they're actually looking for a brand of the device so then i thought to myself well there is no brands right here there's an mm minor that's, that's a little suspicious i could google that so i copied it and i just went to google it and as you can see i have to slide a little bit down because some of the results are in croatian so we're just going to ignore those and I actually didn't find much, but then I wrote malware. And then I thought to myself, I can actually copy the whole line. So I copied the whole line, this one with the minor. And as you can see, the first three results are actually promising. So if I take a look at some of them, you can actually see a bunch of stuff and you can read this if you want to. But the truth is, I actually found the third one to be the most interesting because it says Microtech. Now this is misspelled because it, sh it should say Microtech with K. So then I went into Try Hack Me and I tried Microtech the way it's supposed to be spelled and it actually works. And then the next question asks us to look into sample 2. And it actually requires us to read out the commands in a second example. So that's exactly what we're going to do. Let's just get into that. So as you can see right here, we have some attempts to, you know, echo some root and some weird string into the change password. We can actually see uh, what, what is he trying to do? What are the commands in the second sample changing? And they're attempting to change the root password. And as you can see, this is correct. So they're trying to echo into change password and then bash. Now this is a correct answer, so we can move on. What is the name of the group that runs the botnets in the third sample? So if I cat into the third sample, so if I cat into it, we can actually see that there's some files and stuff like that. And this, this all looks good. But as you remember from before, I actually mentioned that there's an SSH RSA linked to something. And I tried the MDR FCKR. I'm not going to say this because YouTube is going to, you know, demonetize me or something like that. Though I don't even have monetization at this point, but it doesn't really matter. So then I'm going to copy the uh, SSH RSA and I'm going to open the new tab and paste it into Google. And the first result right here actually says Outlaw is back. A new crypto botnet targets European blah, blah blah. So as you can guess, the name is Outlaw and this seems to be correct. So that was the task 7. Let's go into task 8. So the next thing we have is the SSH tunneling. And it talks a little bit about how there are some attacks where they're performed using the SSH tunnels. So as you can see, forwarding by SSH tunnels also allows for attackers to hide their IP in much the same way a VPN could. Now, of course, this isn't ideal, but the idea is if you remember from before I actually had a try hack me challenge where I did SSH tunneling, the forwarding and stuff like that. What happens is let's say you have a service running on a machine, let's say it's an HTTP service and you can't look into it from your machine, right? So what you do is you set up a tunnel and since the victim machine is hosting the service for let's say HTTP on 3000 port, we're actually going to forward this port into our uh, let's say port 80. And then when I navigate to my local host to port 80, I should be able to see the website. This is just one of the examples. But anyways, Kauri will of course record all of the SSH tunneling requests. 
but it will not forward them to their destination. So then we have the question which asks us to look into the sample one into tunneling. What application is being targeted in the first sample? So if I take a look at tunneling, and if I take a look at sample one, you can actually see all of the requests and stuff like that. What it seems to be is like HTTP and we have XML RPC. And as you can see, we have the users blog. Now, if you Google this, you will obviously get the result that this is WordPress. So we don't really have to do that. And if I type in WordPress, it seems to work. Is the URL in the second sample malicious? So yes or no. So let's take a look at the second sample. So we're going to take a look at the URL. So we need to see what URL are we dealing with. So we have an ipapi.com. So this seems to be one of them. And as you can see, it all seems to be the same one so is ipapi.com malicious and i'm gonna go ahead and say no because this is probably just a website that returns your ip address so what this bot or an attacker did is basically they requested to the ipapi.com and they requested json so they wanted to get the ip in a json format and so you can see these requests right here so this basically sums up ssh tunneling for this part so we can actually go ahead and take a look at the last one and as you can see this just basically explains where you can find extra resources and basically there's a greeting thank you for using this room. So that's basically it for today. I found this pretty interesting and educational. I think it does cover the basics of honeypots, but you really do need to know what honeypots are if you're going to do cybersecurity. It's pretty interesting. Uh, maybe if you use Showdown, you can actually remember that there's a honeypot checker as well. It offers, you know, uh, checking to see if it's a honeypot. It tries to detect it. So anyways, that's it for today. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate all the comments and I appreciate all the new subscribers. Thank you for joining my Discord channel so we can chat. If you have any questions, you can ask them there. Uh, we actually do talk. People ask questions and we try to answer them and if it's not me it's some of the users and i really appreciate that community is really growing and people are helping each other and this is what this is all about so anyways leave your questions and comments and i'm going to make sure that i answer them and thank you so much for watching and have a nice day